just start with my conclusion so you guys know. I'm not going to surprise you. Complexity is bad. Functions are simple. That's, that's what we like, and that's what this is all about. So let's get that out of the way. Who is this guy? Who, who is in front of you speaking right now? My name is Colin Lee. I, uh, that's me, Twitter handle. Uh, 30 years programming. Like Today is my birthday, so if you... If If I tell you that I started when I was six, you can do a little bit of math. But uh, Okay, so yeah, I'm working at uh, a hot new startup in town, Vid VidCoo. Uh, we make this awesome product called Flipgrid. You should check it out. If you're in education, we do wonderful things, and we're hiring, of course. Everyone's hiring. Welcome to a convention. So uh, this guy, I, I shouldn't pick on him. He's actually one of the um, founders of Haskell. But I look at the slides behind him, and this is what happens oftentimes when you see a functional programming language lecture, is your eyes just start to glaze over at all the symbols on the screen and the, the scary, scary words. And so we're not going to be like that today. Oh, here we go. Let's all get up. 30 seconds. I just want, want everybody's brains to be awake, because I know but personally I just got my caffeine. 30 seconds. Let's all stretch. This is good. This is getting the blood flowing. This is actually good. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. We should do it at Vid Yeah, we should totally do this at Vidco. Every day. We're going to take a little stretch just to get you guys going. All right, all right. We're all stretched out? We're ready to rock. Okay. So my first contention, oh, we got a long word, of the day is that simple is not equal to easy. I know we all speak English. In the English language, you know, there's all these c connotations between simple and easy, like they're the same thing, the easy button, the simple, they're all. But think of it this way. There are two ways. Uh, there's an easy way and a simple way to get day off from work. You can tell everybody. That would be the simple way. Or you can just not come. That would be the easy way. Now, which one will leave you with a job at the end? <laughs> right, the simple way, right? Right? Am I right? Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about simple today. I'm not talking about easy. You want easy, uh, you're not going to have a very easy job, unfortunately. So we're talking simple. Hey, to a lot of people, they go, go to college. They get a lot of like uh, C CS lectures, computer science. Their, their professor tells them about functional programming, some language like OCaml or Haskell or Scheme or Lisp. And they just hate it because it's not what they're familiar with. They started programming maybe in JavaScript, or maybe they started in, you know, s um, I don't know, any easy language, but not Haskell or Lisp or Scheme or something crazy. A lot of us end up walking away from those lectures just hating dealing. I had, I, I took a ML compiler course at the U of M, and I had to write it in ML for ML, and by the end I hated ML. <laughs> Does anyone have that situation? Or they just Walked out of a functional language lecture and they couldn't ha stand it anymore? No? Yeah? Got a few nods around the room? Okay. From the CS degree people. The thing is, hate tends to f create ignorance. Because if you hate something, you don't learn anything about it. So y y it tends to reinforce itself. Because that ignorance then causes you to fear it. And fear causes you to hate it. And so the, the more that you dislike going through that lecture with the scary symbols in the background, the more that you learn less about it and don't know what you, you, why you need to learn and why it's cool or what's worthwhile to learn from it. And that's, I'm going to tell you today, there are really cool things you should be learning. And just because it's in heavy, heavy talk with scary words and symbols doesn't mean it can't be learned and done and applied more easily, more simply. So we don't need a holy war. We shouldn't to spread revolutionary ideas. Now, it, in programming, there have been many generations of these crazy ideas. I know I've been at it for 30 years. I can say I started on BASIC. I don't know how many people here are still making corporate BASIC code. Anybody? Anybody? Any hands? BASIC? No? Per how about Perl? Perl. Got any Perl programmers? We got a few. Two hands in the back of the room. So we, we go through these generations where languages die naturally, natural deaths, because new ideas come up, and these new ideas are superior. It's not that Perl is a terrible language. You can get all the same stuff done in it but that new ideas appear. And I'm going to talk about some of these. So if you want to see a talk on functional programming in great depth, one of my good buddies from uh, Vidku uh, named Brian Maddy is going to be talking uh, right after lunch. 
So I'm not going to go super, super deep, uh, use any heavy terminology. I'm going to try to, it's more persuasive talk. And if you're looking to learn more about RxJava, you definitely need to see the last talk of the day with Dan Liu. He l loves this stuff, knows it inside and out. His coworkers didn't have to have holy war with him over it because they all love functional languages, and so he got to learn so much RxJava, he will melt your brain with it. And you got to go see that talk if you really want to see RxJava in great depth. I'm just going to use short words for this talk. I am, uh, I'm here, as uh, Harvey Milk once said, I'll do my best straight Harvey Milk. Um, I am here to recruit you. <laughs> I'm here to recruit you to learn new programming principles, something that's actually going to revolutionize the way you write code. And, and it's not even that great of a change. It's not as big as OO, object-oriented programming, was back in the 90s. But it's important because of all the changes we're seeing. And I'll explain a little more. Functions, what are functions? You probably all learned about functions. You might see void functions. There, that's not what you're talking about when we're talking about functional programming. So I mean something with input, output, and no side effects in between. Essentially, most of the time you're doing functions, you're talking about you know, having a, a functional flow from one function to the next, something that doesn't um, do anything unpredictable in between so that you can very easily understand the flow. So what's this reactive term? Uh, everybody throws it around. Nobody understands it. It's become a, there's a reactive manifesto now. If you actually read the reactive manifesto, it reads like business speak. It tells you everything it does and nothing about the underlying technology. I mean, you know, if you, if you go off the reactive manifesto, Microsoft Excel is reactive. But here's what I'm talking about. When I say reactive, a reactive program output is a function of input, and it happens in real time. So you look at that spreadsheet, the effect is reactive. Effectively, it's doing a reactive thing. It just happens to have code behind, the, behind it where the, the output is, not, is going through too many permutations, and it could be simpler than it is. That's what I'm talking about when I say reactive. Output is a function, a function in the functional sense of input. So reactive programming is functional programming. I know you guys who are scared of functional, um, you'll learn why it's really cool and why they've made it easy for normal people like you and me who started out on languages with looping and variables and all these simple, simple ideas. And your professor was right if he taught you functional. There's a lot of cool things to learn. So what is Rx solve? Let's talk about a few things. So here's the first thing. You guys have probably noticed this. Um, you, you, your PCs at home, when I was a kid, you couldn't get more than one co core or one CPU. It was unheard of. You would have to be like a major Eber serious hacker to have more than one processor in your computer. Today, we're going in and up and to the right, and we're going to be up in the hundreds pretty soon on regular PCs on your desktop. And as a programmer, that's a little bit scary because if anybody here has ever dealt with threading and threads, um, that gets intimidating very bad. It gets really, really scary, you know, because now you have to manage those threads. You have to manage the state. And state is something that can get lost very easily. And again, Brian Maddie's talk will go into that in even more detail. I'm just kind of doing an overview here. Another problem, look at the cloud. I mean, again, up and to the right. This is actually an exponential scale, which makes this a little bit deceiving. Looks like it's linear growth, but it's actually exponential here. Um, what's going on is that, you know, we're at a point now where there's so many network uh, API calls going on at a program that it gets very difficult to manage it all. And we need new concepts to make it easier to manage all the threads, all the network calls, and bringing it all back together into one unified user interface. So threading code. Um, Locking, it's, it's a big, scary nightmare. Um, you can deadlock pretty easily. You can, uh, you need to actually know that your threads are working in concert with each other. Errors go crazy. You have an error in a thread in, in, in the middle of a bunch of callbacks and trying to, trying to handle that error, also very scary. We need a way to, to move the errors to one place where we can handle them all and not go you know, mental trying to write a program. Deadlocking, well, it's related to locking, but uh, the idea that um, 
we don't necessarily know. We have to handle every case where something might not come back and uh, how to handle it. Life cycle, let's say you get, we're dealing with mobile now. Mobile phones are constantly interrupted. Let's say you got a phone call in the middle of your app. Is it going to be able to handle, when you get off that call, still having your state it, the way you want it, ready to go for your, for your app still? So there's life cycle problems now. Uh, you have to retry operations over and over again because you may not have network, you know, because we're at a big conference and the Wi-Fi is overloaded. And, uh, you know, I'll be surprised if I get to the end of the talk. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, yes, retry, uh, caching. Someone uh, um, famous said recently that offline first is the new mobile first. The idea that if you're in a coffee shop and you're, you know, if you're on your phone, you're usually waiting for something. And if you're waiting for something, you don't want to have to wait while you wait. Right? No, no one wants that. It, it, it's like, uh, you know, here you, you go to play your, your mobile game while you're, you're um, you know, just taking a quick, quick break from work. You don't want to sit there for a minute, you know, waiting for your thing to load up. Sharing of state. I mean, I can just keep going down this list. Callback hell is where you get, like, several layers deep of callbacks. And if you talk to a lot of JavaScript programmers, I've heard them suggest that the solution to callback hell is you just name the functions. You, you name the callbacks. And then now what you have, instead of having your code scrolling to the right, now you have this nonlinear jumping thing going on where you don't know where the code's coming from, you don't know where it's going to. We call that spaghetti code. And negative testing, because you know, nobody actually tests every possible error state for their app in every possible sense. And all of these things get easier when we write our code differently with a different technology. So anytime you have needless state, it causes accidental complexity. It makes your program more complex, more complex, more ways to fail. And yeah, uh, by chaining functions together in a functional programming sense, you don't have to worry about callback hell. You don't have to worry that you could be jumping all over the program because it's all one chain. So the old way is complex, and complex, as we said at the beginning, is bad. Uh, Ray Ozzie, he's the, uh, was, I believe, the CTO of Microsoft at some point. He was also uh, founded Lotus Notes, uh, ran, I believe, the Microsoft Outlook division. He wrote this memo that inspired a whole bunch of people uh, at Microsoft saying that complexity kills, it sucks life out of developers, we've got to do something different. And this guy named Eric Meyer came along and answered his call for something different that would solve the complexity problem. So again, my, con my conclusion, complexity is bad, but functions are simple. We like functions. The Gang of Four. Who knows the Gang of Four? Anyone? This is not the Gang of Four. <laughs> but I, I, I love the idea that maybe after they finished writing the design patterns book that they shot up a car and torched it and just went for a walk and said, Glad I'm done with that seminal work, and <laughs> it's a good image, anyway. No, the, the Gang of Four wrote the Design Patterns book, and the Design Patterns book was 1994. It revolutionized a lot of ideas about object-oriented programming. It included all kinds of patterns we know and love today, or not, uh, like the, you know, I could just go crazy on them, factory pattern, uh, observer pattern, iterator pattern, you name it. There's dozens in that book. And many of them are, are, you know, like used constantly. Um, and some of those patterns, if you add them together, they come up with this really neat idea that I'm going to tell you about in a little bit here. But at the time, they didn't actually come up with the, the reactive idea. They just kind of danced around the edges. So if you take the observer pattern and you combine it with the iterator pattern, it's okay if you don't know these. Uh, it, it's something we can all pick up later. If you combine these two together and you add ideas from functional programming, you end up with the new reactive extensions ideas. So this guy, this is Jeff Atwood. He writes a very popular blog. You may know Coding Horror. Anybody read Coding Horror? Got a lot of readers. It's, it's a good blog, too, actually. He likes to say that design patterns are a symptom that your language is broken. And I'm going to make a wild statement here. I'm going to say every programming language any one of you uses is broken, including the ones I'm going to advocate today because they can only get better. And it, these design patterns are really working around the edges of a problem. Uh, ultimately, if you can internalize them into your language in the best way possible, you're going to have a better language. 
Yeah, I, I uh, as a <laughs> as a Java programmer, I love this one. This went viral in the, the the Java community. You know, I had a problem, so I thought to use Java design patterns, and now I have a problem factory. Although, if you work for a corporate job, you know, with the big corporate Java job, it would probably be an abstract problem factory factory. M maybe one more. But uh, that's the problem when you, you overdo design patterns. We love design patterns. We wish they were embedded in the language in a way that they were more useful. So he says boilerplate is a form of complexity. And, and we can get around that by changing our languages. This is Eric Meyer. He's my favorite uh, pot smoking hippie. Uh, he, lives, he, he lives in uh, the, the Netherlands. He worked for Microsoft Netherlands in, uh, I think, Amsterdam. And uh, he's the guy who came up with this crazy idea called reactive extensions. This would be, I think, 2007. I don't think they released it until 2009 or so. So this isn't that old, really, uh, the technologies that he created. He created rx.net, and he, he suggested, what's the difference between an array and events? Now, when you think about your program, anything in your program can be an event. Your, your click handlers, every click can be an event. Your variables, every variable change can be an event. A variable not changing could be an event if you, you know, attach uh, something to it to say, happen, check at a certain time. Every single thing in your program can be thought of as an array of events. And that's kind of the idea that I'm getting at, is think about your program in this deep hippie enlightenment. Everything in your program is a stream. Everything is a flow of events happening over time. Entire programming languages have been written with this idea that it's not about variables, it's about events and how you handle them. So what do you guys think? 2015 functional programming, is it going to happen? Is it a thing? Well, let, let's see what people are saying about it. Let's talk about reactive extensions, which is one form of re functional programming. Netflix, these are one of the, the big shot guys who really took off with a bang on reactive programming. They say, we're a big believer in Rx. Uh, it spreads deeper in our code the more we use it. They love it. They wrote many of the libraries, and they uh, use it throughout their company. Netflix does a few you know, things. They're, they have a, a few customers and a little bit of traffic. Yeah. Uh, Microsoft, um, that's where it all started. Um, what does Microsoft say? If async spaghetti code were a disease, Rx is the cure. Kind of witty. Good prescription. GitHub. Uh, the GitHub guys. They loved it a ton when they made their Windows app, so they actually wrote their own library for the, the Mac team. So, I mean, these guys are bought in wholesale. And what about languages? We got Java, JavaScript, C Sharp, other forms of C Sharp, Scala, Clojure, C++, Ruby, Python, Groovy, JRuby, Kotlin, Cocoa, Dart, Rust, and a bunch of others. And everything but the .NET was in the last two years. That's what I call an explosion. So, I mean, we, not only that, but now these, these ideas from reactive programming have gone into the core of languages. Like, the language committees have adopted these ideas and brought them in and made them core Dart. So, any Dart programmers here? No one? Oh, okay. It, it's actually a good language. Just take my word for it. Um, <laughs> it's a good language, but it's broken. So, is it the year? I hope so. I, I think it's getting there. Um, let's take a look at streams. So Java 8, they actually internalize this idea of the iterator pattern into the language in a way I can take this array of numbers. And I don't have to loop over it. I can get all the, the data, stream it, filter it, get only numbers where the number is greater than 4, map it so every number multiplied times 10. At the end, this is going to output only numbers greater than 4 multiplied by 10. So it's very simple, very easy to use. The only problem is it's a synchronous API, and it doesn't do a lot of good for most people because, you know, you can do this in a, in a heartbeat. So it's not that interesting, ultimately, but it does something. Uh, it gets rid of loops, and it does functional style Java in a synchronous manner. So Java at Streams allows you to apply functions to the whole array or collection. Rx Java. So this looks identical because I want it to be very, very similar. You can see it's the same idea. Basically, RxJava is the same ideas done asynchronously. Now, not only can I do this where I'm outputting a bunch of numbers from an array, 
not very exciting, kind of boring, actually. It's async streaming, like I said. Not only that, I can actually then take that number. I can say, uh, well, I just want to take, let's go out to the database, see if it's newer than the cache expiration. We'll go out to the, the network, uh, just grab a copy, and then we'll merge those two results and um, subscribe to them. And, and the, the minute that an event happens where we come back from the d database or the network, well, I'll put that result. And this way, w we can automatically handle going to the network, then the database, and then, you know, uh, I'll put a result, right? All asynchronous, all beautiful, very simple. There's no state here. I, don't, I didn't have to save any variables. You notice that? Not a single variable outside of the callbacks uh, that are basically, they call these lambdas. I said no long words, but I, I just broke my rule. Uh, so ArcsJava allows you to apply those functions to a stream of events, which is really, really cool. Okay. Let's do something even more crazy and even more cool and, and like hippie craziness. Uh, let's look at FRP. This is, func this is true functional programming. This is not, there's no more loops. There's no more variables. It's all immutable. And if you want to hear a lot about it, uh, Brian Maddy will tell you about it after lunch. Uh, functional reactive programming goes beyond reactive extensions. This will actually allow you to do some really crazy, incredible things. For example, you can time travel. Uh, because it's pure, um, you can basically, well, because it has pure functions, because it has a mutable state, you can ac actually tell at every point in time th through the past and into the future what it's going to be because you, you know all there are no side effects, so you know exactly how to tra time travel within the language. Uh, Rx tries to be both the best of both worlds. Obviously, you can't do certain things in Rx you can do with FRP, and I'm going to show you one of those in just a little bit here. So in FRP, time's only a variable, and we can change time. We're going to do that. Now let's uh, look at a little talk here. Hopefully our Wi-Fi doesn't cut out on us. Has anyone seen Brett Victor's Inventing on Principle? Yeah? Got a few hands? Let's see. We'll just watch a little bit for a refresh here. Hopefully my sound works. Try not to blast people. Oh. One, two, there we go. So uh, Brett Victor, what he's showing us is really awesome. And this was actually 
a mock-up he did in, in JavaScript. Brett Victor's a designer. He's a brilliant guy, gr brilliant ideas, and yet this wasn't actually like showing something that really kind of worked yet in the, in the sense he wanted it to. It's cool, but someone actually had to come along and build that. Let's see. So, one sec here. Uh, click outside. There we go. So time travel is easy. Totally easy. Uh, Brett Victor makes it look easy, but that's just a mock-up. Let's look at some real time travel here. This is a language called Elm. It's a web programming language. It's called. It's a functional reactive programming language. So, it's a very very dense uh, format. You'll notice how tight the syntax there is. I noticed uh, a critic of uh, Elm actually was writing a, a blog post on it. He had a uh, code that was 300 lines in J JS and and the Backbone JS. Cut it down to 200 with Angular, and rewrote his app in Elm and got it down to 50 lines. Um, very dense language, kind of hard to read at times, unfortunately. Um, but this is functional reactive programming, and I'll show you something really, really cool you can do with it. Let's see, you just saw the braid character. Let's take a look at Mario. So here's Mario. Um, I'm going to introduce a bug into this program. I'll do. I don't know. All right, so we'll restart him. Mario's going to take a little jump. Whoa! Looks like if I do it right, I can fly with Mario or double jump, triple jump, jump in indefinitely. So let's pause time. So what we've seen so far is we're just tracing his steps. There's actually a, a debug.watch up there on the left. You can see if I comment that out, his, his path goes away. Um, I'm doing this stuff live. This is actually in the programming language uh, right now. And I can mess with his velocity right here. Uh, this is changing gravity at the moment. You'll notice at gravity values, uh, where it's like 1.5 and 1.0, he seems to be able to double jump, triple jump, fly, go nuts. Which, you know, I as cool as it is, he probably we want him to have the, the, the raccoon suit while he's doing that. We don't want him to just jump randomly and fly all the time. So for our game programming purposes, we're going to want to figure out what gravity, uh, what's causing this to happen, honestly. So let's go back in time. Let's just back it up a little bit here. Here we go. So we can see at the, the peak of these jumps, uh, he, here's his velocity uh, on y is less than 1. You see it never actually hit 0 here in the, the when he reaches the peak of his jump. Never quite touches 0. But if we change this to a r something where it's like 0.5 or 1.0, uh, we get a perfect zero at the peak, and he suddenly his velocity jumps up to six because that's happening here. So we can very easily debug our program by tra traveling back in time, and after I back up time, I can easily then change the future. So something really awesome. So yeah, I just changed the history, I changed the future. I'm totally awesome, right? <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> now it's your turn, guys. So complexity, complexity is bad. We all agree, right? Complexity sucks. And functions are simple. So does anyone have any questions? Because I want to actually like give you some time not just to ask the questions, but to say whatever you feel like. I mean, I, I want to talk about this. R recruiting for revolution, right? Questions, come on. Oh, someone, no? I'll pass the mic. Which functional language do you guys use in your company? Oh, uh, in my company right now, uh, we're using two functional languages. Uh, well, okay. Brian, in, in his spare time, runs Clojure.mn. You know, so he actually runs a meetup group for Clojure, which is a Lisp, which is totally awesome. Uh, in our company right now, we're using functional principles through reactive extensions. I, I use RxJava. Our iOS team uses Reactive Coco. They're wonderful libraries, and you should definitely check them out. Because what it allows you to do, like I showed before, is handle the uh, stream of events without having to hang on to state and then gets rid of all that uh, accidental complexity that makes our lives scary in so many ways. Yeah. Sure. 
So when you guys go out to recruit new developers, do you run into a wall like on day one trying to get these guys up to speed with functional programming? I'm going to let someone answer that who just uh, joined and uh, just started learning functional. What do you think about it, uh, Nate? Uh, under Colin's great leadership, <laughs> uh, in the last week, I've managed to pick this up. Um, don't be afraid of it. It's pretty awesome once you get it. And obviously, we've been working together for 11 days, and <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good language, so. Thanks, Nate. I, I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't write the checks. <laughs> uh, who, who, who has another question? No? Come on. Oh, yeah, right there. Okay. So with all the events and stuff, are there addition memory overhead here? You know? I'm trying to think of the the memory overhead of events. Yes, uh, in Elm or a language like that especially, what they do is they basically, th there are ideas of state in Elm, but you have to basically specify that you want state if you do want to keep it. Uh, in addition, you have to deal with things like, um, one, of the, one of the biggest times you get memory overhead issues is when they have this thing called, um, now I'm just drawing a blank, so back pressure. Back, I, I said no long words, and of course the questions make me do it. Uh, back pressure is when you have maybe two or three event streams, you want to combine those streams together, like in Ghostbusters or whatever. Combine the streams, and uh, what, what happens is one stream will produce much faster than the other ones, which means you're going to have to do one of two things. Either you have to buffer and hang on to events for a while, or you have to throw events away. And y often it's a combination of both. Now, if you're hanging on to a lot of events, if you've got something overproducing, you can run into serious memory issues. But I, I can say from experience that in terms of memory leaks, you can leak s memory much, much, much easier when you're hanging on to state than when you're hanging on to a, a couple events that happened you know, a little a few minutes ago. Right. OK, pass this on here. That question made me wonder, so is there have you heard of anything like reactive reactive programming where you have more input than you can possibly process at once so you just scale up the amount of processors i also think it's a really good marketing you might be able to get a lot out of that <laughs> uh i haven't actually heard of that uh idea but i i, I could see where you're going with it um obviously if you're throwing events away there might be a possibility where you, you'd be interested in hanging on to some but Ultimately, you know, if you're throwing events away, it also means that, um, you know, they may not have been, it, it, think of it this way, maybe you have an analytics problem, you're storing data, and throwing events away is actually throwing away revenue. In, in that case, yes, you could attack the problem with more storage, more, more threads, more CPUs, um, but ultimately, it, it's, it's not 100% solvable because, you know, you're going hit, to hit a limit at some, a wall at some point doing that kind of thing. Um, I'll pass the mic again. Thank you. Um, what would some advantages be of using the reactive frameworks instead of like adopting a similar pattern with, say, promises? That's a good question. Uh, actually, believe it or not, uh, uh, when I talk about reactive a lot of times, I like to frame it in terms people understand. Promises and futures are all part of reactive. You're already using f promises here. Well, all this is is an array of promises. That the whole language is based on taking an array of promises and tacking functions on the end to do whatever you want with them. So what you're doing is you're not, you're not getting, doing away with promises. You're making promises more powerful. You're actually just extending the pattern further beyond the you know, simple promises. So good question. There we go. One in the back there. Uh, is there what you would call a gold standard Rx extension? If if someone were to say be writing uh, a new R extension for a different language, what would you say is the API set to match? Oh boy, <laughs> <laughs> that's a really tough question. Um, I, I know Netflix and Rx Java has been treated as the gold standard extension. Uh, some, you know, obviously Rx.net came up with the ideas in the first place, and they have taken ideas back from Rx Java to Rx.net. I wouldn't say that makes it the best. I think it's it's very much an evolving standard. The fact that I would say, what is it like? at least 15 or 20 languages started doing this in the last two years means that it's growing very, very fast and there's a lot of new ideas happening all at once. You've got languages like BaconJS 
So there's competing standards for JavaScript reactive. You can do RxJS or BaconJS and, and decide do you want to go more FRP or do you want to go just reactive, you know, on its own without the overkill functional reactive programming. Uh, another question right here. I'll take this. This might be the wrong granularity for this forum, but uh, given Java, how are you handling the threading model with these? You're registering for streams and they go away when the request does, right? I mean. Uh, so how am I handling uh, threading in the Java model? Uh, Java concurrency libraries are pretty awful, honestly. They, they do a good enough job to get the job done. But uh, fortunately, using Rx, they have uh, what they call schedulers. I, I did actually show schedulers a little bit ago here. If I can back up to it. Oh, I just lost signal. Good timing. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, anyway, so schedulers allow you to decide what executor runs the request. You can ha I do a lot of Android programming with Java. And so well, oftentimes what you want to do is you want to run your network requests on a special thread for networking requests. And then you want to run the subscription, the result, on the main thread because you can't make UI updates. Here we go. You can't make UI updates on any thread on a Android except the main thread. So they make this very, very easy in Rx Java. And again, if you want more detail on this piece, go see Dan Liu's talk to learn all about Rx Java. If you look right here, subscribe on tells you where all the background work gets done. Observe on tells you where the results are handled. And you can set these to anything. And you can actually say schedulers.from and pass in an executor object, which could be a thread pool or anything you want it to be. So this, this is beautiful in terms of concurrency models. It makes your life a lot easier. And I can say from experience. Uh, another question? I uh, hope you guys all enjoyed it. Uh, I'll give you some time back so you can enjoy uh, networking and have a great conference. All right.